my name is uh, Dr. Chuck Weber. I'm a psychiatrist and have a, uh, also Dr. Jeff here. He's a doctoral level CRNA. He's doing my ketamine. I have just a couple, um, a couple slides on, on ketamine and how we kind of augment. So I'd like to both introduce not only our clinic and what we do, but also TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And as you can see with the title, what I really want you all to think about and what I, I hope to impress on you is, one, it's been around for a while, but that it is kind of pushing against some of the prevailing wisdom. And I think that we are just at the cusp of the things that TMS can actually accomplish. So, I'd like to start with something funny, of course. The voices, if you can't read this, hey, I'm convinced. 10 out of the nine voices in the head tell me that I'm perfectly sane. So, I do know that the uh, voices are not real, but they still have some pretty good ideas. So, we have a lot of dark humor. So I'm not going to read our, uh, my slides. I figure that everybody in here is very learned and uh, educated, so we're just going to go and, and tell you certain things about what we're going to be doing. So our mission and vision. I think that all of us here are actually, you know, of course, trying to reduce <coughs> suffering, take care of our community, take care of the patient that's in front of us. And one of the things that I really wanted to focus on, especially leaving um, the chief of behavioral health's kind of job was how can I affect in a global sense and how can I affect more as a community and I've been in a, in a very uh, blessed situation to be able to do that and to surround myself with some people that are much more giving, more and smarter than me and uh, in, in making this organization. And our, our main mission is our, our veterans and our DOD but now after four years we've expanded to serving about 20 different insurances and kind of moving to more of that civilian side. So a little bit on our background, like I said, you guys can read this. So I, I really want to do a little bit more of a narrative, a little quote unquote story, right? So you can read this, and this is a, uh, you know, this is the end point, right? This is the things that we're doing right now. But all of us here had a, a beginning. All of us got into psychiatry, behavioral health, uh, for a reason. And, and hopefully that's to, to help our, you know, fellow humans and reduce that suffering. But it had to start somewhere. So before saying, hey, this guy, uh, you know, prior service infantryman, so those are guys I, I carried stuff, I dug foxholes, and I shot at things. So I'm educated beyond my intelligence. But it still took a, a, a very long route. But it also took a long route for us in psychiatry and behavioral health in general. And go back just a little bit farther is uh, Galen. So you might know who Galen is. Galen, yes. So he is a Roman physician. Roman physician. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, yeah. Speak up. Speak up? All right, I moved it away because we're like, boom. So I got to use my big boy voice. Okay, I'll use my big boy voice. So Galen was 120 uh, AD to 200 AD. Very famous, like the most famous Roman physician. And at the time, if you guys, just to go a little bit more history, it was kept on. The prevailing wisdom at the time was the humors, right? Yellow, black bile. Black bile was, in our world, the melancholy, uh, phlegm, and blood. So they tried to affect those four humors. Well, Galen actually pushed that prevailing wisdom, and he was convinced that there was something anatomical. And he was really known for being a great surgeon. And it was against the, the laws of the Roman time to actually dissect humans. And so what he did was he dissected pigs, apes, other kind of animals. But he became so versed at it that uh, he taught so many uh, of the medical students at the time, or medical <coughs> practitioners at the time, that he actually became one of the most famous uh, gladiator physicians. So before him, a, a, the gladiators in about a year would lose about 60 gladiators. During his tenure, they lose, he lost five. And this was his knowledge of wounds and his knowledge of, of, uh, of surgery and anatomy. So we see it parsing out, the prevailing wisdom bloodletting and all the kind of phlegm and, and all the, those humors, and he pushed it to that next level. And his uh, anatomy and some of the things that he taught were still taught in medical schools until 1540, so almost 1500 years later. So you kind of wonder when those things are, are pushed. So we're seeing a big leap as we go forward. Okay. So I'll tell a little bit more of the story and then go to, to these two ugly mugs right here and the better looking Dr. Weber. Um, so, 
She's a family practice, we have CRNA, psychiatrist, and prior to flight surgeon. Here is a, a funny story. This is uh, my leaders and my prescribers. We did team building. A little note to self, you should not let a airborne infantryman pick your team building. Uh, so uh, this uh, rafting experience was really <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> However, when they said we have one class five, and if you don't know, class five is pretty big and scary. So when I saw three of my providers fly out of the, the rafts, uh, it, a lot of things went through my head. Um, that it was very scary. It was very team building. Death has a reason to bring us together. And so uh, that part worked. Uh, however, I really probably don't suggest that. I think our next team building was bowling. So, uh, okay, go ahead, next slide. So a little bit of our staff right now. How many that we have? Now, 70% of us are prior service, married to the military, brats, you know, military brats in some sense. I really wanted to surround ourselves with culturally competent. We get a lot of applications for doing internship. And yeah, I, we look at everybody, but I really give that predilection towards those culturally competent uh, providers. Because that's really what I focus on. Now, you know, I, I'm addiction uh, medicine as well. So I don't need to do heroin to know that it, you know, it's heroin. Uh, is bad, right? You don't need to taste dirt to know it's, it's bad for you. However, it does bridge that gap, kind of having that empathy. A good provider, you're going to build that rapport and you're going to go forward with that. We just might have a little bit of a leg up uh, for that first contact. So, kind of interesting guy here. So, going back to our story a little bit. So, this guy is Johan Rail. Did I say that off Deutsch, right? Rail? Johan, yeah. Johan Rail, okay. So Johann Rehl, and he uh, was another physician, but he's also a philosopher. So he also, in the 1700s, pushed that prevailing wisdom as well. There was a, basically saying, if you were insane, if you were mad, you will always be mad. There is no cure, and that was the prevailing wisdom of medicine at that time. Well, he actually thought that there was something else to that. And so he actually is the first one to coin the term psychiatry. In, uh, in, in Greek, so psychiatry, soul and mind, right, psych, and then it, actually iatry is actually two Greek words together. Latros means physician, and la, la, latrika is actually uh, going to be medicine. And so it's those who specialize in treating the soul and mind. And so to take even from Gali to say there's something different than the humors, and we have somebody saying, wait a second, these, there is a possible cure, or we should be looking at this differently. You're not just crazy and you're housed away. And so, let's go back. Go ahead. Next slide. So this is a little bit of a culmination of that before I get into the team match. You're like, what the heck? What is this? Well, <clears throat> there's a plan. There's a plan. So <clears throat> just to do a little bit, Benjamin Rush, okay? Dr. Benjamin Rush, considered the first psychiatry in America, signer of the Declaration of Independence. And he was actually wrote the first book in America about psychiatry. I forget the name of it. And as we kind of go forward, everybody was put into asylums back then. Does everybody know the difference between asylum and sanatorium? Way back in the 1800s, anybody? All right. It has to do with money. <laughs> so if you did not have money, you went to the asylum. If you had money, you went to the sanatorium, okay? They were much nicer. Well, Dorothy, Miss Dorothy Dix here was a huge proponent uh, back in 1785, uh, around there. Don't quote me on all these things, somebody can Google fact check me. We're going for memory. The memory is the second thing to go, you know? <laughs> so back in 1785, she, she really, I'm oh, sorry, 18, um, in the 1800s, she really pushed for there to be a state-sponsored state asylum. Because they were really housed. They took the madness, the insane people, and they, they actually just kind of housed them away. She thought that compassionate, uh, approach towards them was the only way to go. And so she really pushed the legislators to start creating these state hospitals. Now, we have a little bit of a sorry history, right? We, we didn't really do it right. We stumbled along uh, the way. Uh, but she was a huge proponent of that. All right, anybody know this person? The father of American psychology, okay? Dr. James, okay? And everybody knows Freud, I don't want to do that. <laughs> now, these people pushed those envelopes, even, um, Dr. James, he actually was in Harvard, and he actually had to take a break for a year and went over to Germany and started a psychoanalyst. 
then he came back. So he was actually the first person to teach psychology at Harvard. So once again, a lot of people, there's, I think it's uh, Dr. Uh, Wilhelm uh, Wundt is actually supposedly the father of psychology, but I was trying to pick America, um, even though I threw for it. Now, not, these are the good people that kind of try to push and push that prevailing wisdom at the time. Of course, Freud being a neurologist, and not knowing why that melancholy was dying in front of him. But we also have some bad players. So not only phrenology, anybody know who this person is? All right, so in those asylums, everybody was trying to get the best cure. All right, so this, this person is uh, Dr. William All, A-W-L. He said if he went to his asylum, he would do 100% cure rate of insanity and madness. So his nickname was the Cure All. It wasn't 100%. Okay, next slide. All right, so we are, we are doing a lot of the great things in, in Colorado Springs, but we cannot do it alone. Even as we've seen, as this kind of history, as we're kind of pushing this prevailing wisdom, in here we'll probably have five or six different vocations. And I think that's great. And even what we've created at the Family Care Center, we need those holistic approach. Because there's so many different ways, a thousand paths to Rome, right? And as we kind of understand more, there's more that we can actually complement. So I really appreciate, one, everybody showing up, and also that everybody, what you're doing for your patients and for your communities, whether it's the Springs or, or whatnot. Uh, because you are adding to that history, and uh, I, I really do believe that. This is, a, this, is, this is our passion. Okay, go ahead, next slide. All right, down in that, uh, we're going to have five locations coming up here. The one's opening up in just a few days up in Monument. Next, please. All right, another push on the prevailing wisdom, okay? So this was actually from Dr. Sperry. Dr. Sperry in the 1960s, he said that these were the two. Now, it's not this black and white. You might have been taught this or seen this in grade school. But you kind of wonder, uh, in 100 or 200 years, you know, what are they going to look at us and, and uh, what is our, uh, our future going to hold for us? But there is a little bit more to this. And of course, not doing lobotomy anymore. That has its own presentation. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Next slide. Sorry. Just for completeness, we're not going to go over, in a sense, uh, MDD, but if, this is the DSM, uh, the sense criteria. Here are some demographics. Now, for those that are not from Colorado, okay, if you looked at US News and World Report, Colorado Springs is always in the top five as far as best places to live, best places to retire. I think currently, we're number five right now uh, for this year. However, we have some other dubious uh, statistics, and those are number three for suicides. So currently we're about 26 per 100K. The average for America is 13.5 per 100K. And El Paso County, the county that you're in right now, we are the number one for veteran suicides in the state. So we're very blessed to have uh, on, on our staff, uh, Dwayne France, he's a counselor and also another vet, and retired NCO. And uh, he is on the governor's and the El Paso suicide convention. And so I'm really glad that he can support that. And it's, it's huge especially for our most vulnerable. As you can see, some of these, if you can't read in the bottom, depending on the, even the sexual orientation, 42 per 100K, I mean, it's, it's abysmal. So there's a lot of the demographics that we have to focus on. Now, this, uh, this slide just to kind of just show you a little bit about what's not being treated and why all of you are needed so much and why there's a place, TMS meds, spiritual, holistic approach. Married to a family practice, okay, so you can say, hey, I love her, but the majority of these health professionals that are taking care of our psych patients are family practice. They know a lot <coughs> of areas, but not very deep. And so I would contend that there's a lot undertreated, and you add that with a no treatment, and you have a significant portion of our patient population that is really getting either inadequate care or no care. Go ahead. And cannot have, we have all these great theories and we're not going to do a cure-all, but we have to definitely look at, you can't have these, the military used to call them good idea fairies. You can't have a good idea fairy without results, but we have to kind of know where we're going with that. So this is an axial view, okay, so this is actually the left side. So when they've looked at about 10,000 of these spec scans, okay, single positron emission tomography or computer tomography, 
these are the things that are lighting up, the things that are people that are not depressed. I should change this from normal, because I don't even know what normal is anymore. So it's really not depressed. All the brain is working, both sides are working, and they're doing activities, and they're actually uh, doing functional MRIs. People that are depressed, these areas are not working. So this has been shown consistently over and over. This just one from the males. So what does that mean? So what that means, in uh, a better view for, for some people, sometimes uh, radiology is a little bit uh, difficult, but the cortical limbic system, what it's showing here is this area right here is on the executive function. So just as a little bit of a reminder for everybody, I, I contend that uh, anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, social phobia, it really cannot exist without a frontal lobe. We need to process these things, we need to go into those dark places, we need to actually plan our suicide, we need to actually plan that fear and that anxiety that's going on. We might have our amygdala, our alarm system going off, we might have <coughs> bad memories in the hippocampus that are giving us those cues, but we have to process it. So what if that process, either not working enough or overworking, so there's a hypo or hyperactive kind of portion, and what they've showed back on that other slide, in that dorsal prefrontal cortex, this area is not working and it's not working for all the neuroreceptors. And there's only a few of our meds that uh, actually uh, work very well. Go ahead. So I, I threw this in here. I'm not gonna do total endocrine, but sometimes it's hard for people to, on the neuroanatomy, kind of conceptualize. But the endocrine system is very easy to kind of say, if something is not working, just say for the thyroid, we try to, uh, we try to, you know, actually kind of direct that. So we look at something called a thyroid stimulating hormone. It actually will send a signal to say we need to produce more of T3 and T4. And then when there is a lot of T3, T4, there's a feedback loop that says turn off the TSH. So this feedback loop is in a lot of different systems. So it's basically our safety or our control. This is happening in the brain as well, unless you have depression or anxiety. What if it's going on and it's not turning off or it's not firing enough? And the endocrine system is a, a good way to show this. The other portion, is, why I put this in here for the endocrine system is another history factoid, uh, diabetes. Everybody heard of diabetes? All right? Did you know that like, right in the beginning that they thought that diabetes was a psychic condition? All right? So think of this, so diabetes one, okay, so those are the ones that are insulin dependent. It's kind of before we did the insulin. If you were a little boy or a little girl, always drank water, was were lethargic, uh, couldn't really work, didn't have energy, couldn't concentrate, you were called dumb and lazy. And they, you were kind of marginalized. You know? And then, of course, you go into diabetic ketoacidosis and die. <laughs> so, not good. And, uh, and in that sense, now that we know that it's the pancreas and the islet cells that are not working and not producing those insulin, it's moved away from that and it's back into our you know, internal medicine and endocrinology of brothers and sisters. So there are, I think, a lot of answers. And I like to do, I was a flight surgeon before, so I'm both the real doc, so I do like to do a lot of shotguns initially uh, when I first see somebody, but not to just discount, oh, it's a psych condition. Go ahead, next. So going into treatment, not going to be doing lobotomy. And these are the different kind of modalities. Uh, we will have a, uh, you know, a uh, question period at the end, but there's a lot of other things. Some of them I don't know. I, I really focus on evidence base. I want to take two of our big boys right here. So serotonin and dopamine. Serotonin, mood and anxiety. Dopamine, pleasure, sex, chocolate, cocaine. Don't do cocaine. It will work for 30 minutes, but that's about it. And you have a lot of other problems. Some of our other ones that we kind of try to affect, one of the two biggest ones that are actually in the brain are GABA and glutamate. GABA is an inhibitory, glutamate is excitatory. The glutamate has an actual, another uh, very important role. Too much glutamate, and this means you have paranoia, anxiety, panic attacks. Too little, you can have depression. So what it's really uh, saying is we need homeostasis, we need balance. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Now I have to add this because I've been doing this lecture and I, I've changed it with new, new information. But at the end, I always get the question on marijuana. We're in Colorado. So, I'm gonna just go just a few slides over this. So, you can't really read this, but I am addiction board certified, been in Colorado for a while. I'm not a fan of marijuana. 
the reason why I'm not a fan of marijuana is three to five percent was the THC level, okay? The one cannabinoid that gives the psychoactive portion uh, in the 60s. It is around 40 to 50 percent. We are in a whole different world right now for what marijuana is, is going to do. Now, the cannabinoids, the CBD, as you've heard, we do. We have about four meds for that. They're going to be for nausea. They're going to be for appetite, kind of raised for chemotherapy. There is a, a pain aspect, but if anybody didn't actually read uh, the, uh, the actual study for it, it's for blepharospasm and musculosclerosis. <laughs> that is actually the indication for it. So they, they like to say it's for you know chronic, every kind of pain. I would say for your patients, and I like to just contend, if they have depression, anxiety, uh, uh, panic attacks, this will not work for them. It will work for them like a, a Snickers bar for a diabetic. It will work for about an hour and a half, but eventually it will, it will give out uh, because of the THC levels. Now, I think that once we do a little bit more on the cannabinoids, we actually can help. What they've actually shown is all of these things are happening. And imagine, we try to work on this, right? Their anxiety, their paranoia, their addictions, loss of motivation so all of these things are affected uh, with the THC I really have not found and I, I actually scurried the uh, uh, NIMH and NIH last night just to see if there's anything new the studies that are positive we wouldn't call them studies in psychiatry it was the cure-all right it was a study of 24 people of 10 people <laughs> that were positive you're like no let's 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 go with like 10 30,000 and then then you've got my, my attention next slide just a couple things, another, uh, this is uh, another spec scan. So normal, healthy brain. This is an 18 year old. It didn't have to be daily use. So if you can see, you don't have to kind of know the areas of the brain, just to know not a lot of holes, a lot of holes. A 16 year old with two years of daily use, and this almost looks like an Alzheimer's patient. Okay? So that daily use and the use before the age of 24 is coming back over and over as not being good. In fact, there's an 18% chance to cause schizophrenia. Um, yes, a, a question about, do you have studies, images like this of brains after someone stops for several years? Like, that 16-year-old stops, what does that brain look like four years later? Sure, so there is neuronal growth, and the neuronal growth will be helped, but don't quote me. On this, but there's something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and actually TMS, ketamine, and ECT release that. Your brain naturally produces that, but just think of it as a, a, a millimeter a year, okay? So a, 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 so a little bit of a neuronal growth, and you are tearing it up like this. It's, it would take a lifetime to actually go back, but I actually believe in neuroplasticity as well, so stroke victims, it is dead. In the necrotic part of your brain, you can rewire it. What does psychotherapy, what they've shown in for psychotherapy is rewiring of the brain. So there is ways around it, but it's kind of hard to bring back the dead. You know, Frankenstein's a good movie, but we haven't actually done that yet. <laughs> Go ahead, next slide. Another this the aspect that I said with psychosis, you know, if you guys, you guys can't see, but these studies to show cases of schizophrenia, risk for multiple schizophrenia, these, the N is 45,000, this N is 1,000. These are very, very big studies. Good. Now, I want to bring it back to Colorado too. So our Colorado suicide rate, it's very high. I'm not going to do one of the old kind of school on, on do, do direct causality, but when we look at the boom in the medical dispensaries, legalization of recreational, one can contend as the suicides go up and the national average is still this low, 13.5, it ain't helping. <laughs> so that would be the only thing that I contend is as you kind of think about this, because if, if we put on our white coat and our stethoscope, you know, I don't know when the last time I did that, but if I did put that on and told you anything, usually it works 30% of the time. That's the placebo. And so when, you, when people have said, this is the only thing that works for me, doc, it's the only thing for PTSD, anxiety, depression, when you look at big studies, it's only about 30%. It has not beaten that placebo yet. But you will find people that that's what works, okay? And number of suicides for marijuana present by year. This is just whole neck. That, that, that one was Colorado. This one is actually uh, for the whole United States. Okay, ECT. I, I cannot talk like uh, everybody saw Dr. Merciniak's <clears throat> thing yesterday. So he's, uh, he's great. In fact, if they fail TMS, I, I'll send them to uh, Dr. Merciniak. But I wanted to do a little bit because we're actually going to take advantage of some of the physics on ECT when we're doing TMS. Next slide. 
Thanks, please. So a little bit of an intro. This guy's actually still alive. I don't know, it wasn't like a dead white guy. It's a, it's a live white guy. Okay. Dr. Anthony Barker, uh, 1984. He basically showed that we're actually uh, can, can create uh, that cortical activity with a magnet. Now, everybody has you've heard of the EEGs, right? Okay. So if what, what it's doing is it's reading voltage that your neurons are actually creating. It's going through the skull. All right. So we are a neurochemical machine up there. So it, it makes sense that we can take advantage of that. So actually, those trials actually started very long ago. I mean, not like the 1700s or Galen, but a lot longer than when it took to get treatment resistant. And actually, it wasn't until about 2013 that insurance has started picking it up. Not all of them are actually there yet. Because a lot of them, the FDA says one failed med, but most insurances, they, some ask, I want four with two augmentations, and did you try lithium? And I mean, is, is there a full moon tonight? It's, yeah, the military did not teach me about insurances. And the people that are really good are the people with side effects. If you looked at those people that are undertreated or not treated, a lot of them are that they don't want to take meds, or that they, all of them have failed. Now, some of the gene tests are helping us, but even the gene tests are not great. Those are probabilities. Okay, and recent indication for OCD. Sorry. Sorry about that, Dr. Nina. All right, so how does it work? Okay. So once again, another two dead white guys. I, I can't get away from that yet. Okay. <laughs> so Faraday was actually, he was an inventor, and he was an experimenter, but he didn't know math. So he kind of figured out that a magnetic current creates an electric charge. But he couldn't figure that out. So that's just where Maxwell comes in. Maxwell was the math mathematician that figured out how that actually works in a mathematical. So we, you kind of usually put those things together. Now, extend that, uh, you know, 100 years or so, and then now we have something that actually can affect. Those two areas that we kind of focus on is an, an H coil and an, a figure eight. Uh, we're gonna go over this a little bit more, but basically it's placing on those areas that are not working, and then you're gonna see these actual waveforms work. Oh, uh, they can't hear you. Can't hear me, okay. I'll get closer, or do you wanna do that thing? Far left one? Uh, just a little bit, it's, it's really sensitive. Man. Apologies. No. Is, that, is that perfect? Not worse? Okay. That doesn't sound perfect. But okay, next slide please. Okay, so this is the repetitive TMS. So, so, to do a pulse that's going over and over again, and this is how it's working. Electricity is going through, and our machines are they're like mini MRI machines, so they actually have to get their own electrical kind of like outlet and, and whole panel uh, for themselves. The electricity goes through, induces a, a magnetic uh, pulse. That magnetic pulse goes and it creates neuronal excitability. These can see, they, they actually had some that figured in all of them. I like the uh, figure eight a lot more because it's a lot more directed. So thank you all for paying your taxes. I'm educated by my intelligence, like I said, but I, with this, I can actually use the neuroanatomy and put them in the areas that are very specific. And we're gonna get into a little bit on waveforms and why that is so important to have a very directed kind of blast. So this is where most of the magnets, uh, magnetic pulse is going, but then also where that neuronal excitability is going to be. So waveforms. Waveforms are very important. We're not going to go through a whole sleep thing, but basically I'm awake, I'm awake and active. This is deep sleep meditation, yoga, sleep. Okay. Yeah. And so this is actually the uh, which one's the right one in the way? I can't remember. But when you have that waveform, it's creating a voltage, and depending even on the angle, is going to change the voltage too. So it's it's very user specific on what you're going to do. Now, if any, another factoid is to know what waveform that the brain talks to other parts of the brain. Anybody? You only have four choices. <laughs> really? No participation? Okay, no. But thank you for trying. <laughs> thank you for trying. You're awesome. Theta. She's here at Evans too. Okay, so it's theta. And theta is how uh, the brain kind of talks to each other. So this is, there's a, you know, that's why even when I we do this biopsychosocial spiritual, a lot of people don't want to do religion. Hey, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, you have to do something. Alcohol is going to have uh, problems. It doesn't, it doesn't really work, and I can induce the seizure. Uh, and also other drugs. My, my biggest failures are the daily marijuana users. Go ahead. So what is it doing? Those neurons, now this is actually the, the to me, the kind of cool and kind of geek out 
So even though I'm a Star Wars guy, this is really Star Trek. Okay? So the, uh, the, the Star Trek kind of portion of it is different parts of your brain do different things, right? So we've already known the dorsal prefrontal cortex is going to be the one that's going to be hit for depression on the left side. On the right side, a lot of attention and anxiety kind of portion. So depending on the waveform and the frequency that we pick, we can turn on or lower down, so have neuronal excitability, or actually tone down the excitability depending on the frequency. And so it's, it's very, very interesting. Now, all, everything on the right is uh, not FDA approved right now, but there's a lot of literature on it. And it's not 10, 20 studies. We're talking, you know, it's 50, 60 with you know, thousands of people. So we're not gonna experiment, and we always do let them know if we're gonna do something on the right side uh, that it, it is, it's, it's really not FDA approved. But the, the cool thing is, is changing that frequency, changing that location, I can, I can actually target. And the cool thing that is uh, different than our meds, our meds, yes, we can affect, Prozac is going to affect serotonin. Zoloft is probably the most serotonin only, right? There's a little bit of everything, right? We don't really have very pure meds. But if I do TMS and I in an electrical field in the dorsal prefrontal cortex or whatever I pick, I am going to hit every single nerve receptor. I will hit serotonin, dopamine. I'll hit norepinephrine, I'll hit GABA, I'll hit glutamate, I'll hit acetylcholine. All of those things are going to be reset. And we really don't have anything in the inventory that's going to do that. Uh, now, head-to-head, -head, uh, ECT has kind of beaten it. But if anybody has looked at uh, the, uh, you know, the lecture with Dr. Marciniak, you know, it's about one in three with memory problems. I do need uh, a CRNA, I need an operating room, you can't drive that day. This is not invasive. We're going to rebalance you. Next. So here is one of the machines. This is the one I have. I had another one, and I pretty much focused on this. This is the MagVeter or MagVenture. The reason why I picked it is I'm part of a clinical society, and this is what they use for the experiments. And so I don't experiment on people. We do the ethical thing, but I look at what smarter people have done and then try to reproduce it for, for uh, some of the non-FDA approaches. And it takes advantage with this arm that I can pick anywhere part on the brain. So, no restrictions. It's not like that ECT. You're awake. We have Netflix or YouTube. One person listened and learned Spanish during their 20 minutes uh, uh, sessions. It's about for six weeks. There is a tapping sensation. Just so anybody's had an MRI, it's the tap tap. Actually, most people don't wear earplugs. We offer them because it's really not that loud because you're not in that uh, booming box of the MRI. And uh, really very, very well tolerated. Next slide. So here's the to tolerability. All of my meds, all the systems that kind of affect, you know, affect, uh, I think, uh, our psychiatry brothers and sisters or nurse practitioners, we, and if, you, if you've done it for a while, sometimes you're picking the med to actually pick the side effect. All right, you're having insomnia, you're going to get a sedating one. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not eating, well, you're going to get something that's going to stimulate appetite. I mean, we kind of, not only picked it for its increasing serotonin and dopamine or norepi, but we're actually trying to pick it for the side effects. This the biggest side effect is a headache for the first couple sessions, and it goes away. And it actually makes migraines better. It's being actually studied for migraine because there's a vasodilation portion. So I, I didn't put it down on the contraindications. One, you can't have metal in your head, so you know, shrapnel is not good. You had, dental is non-ferrous, so it's not been a problem. Uh, and the seizure is about a 0.1 to 0.3% chance for a seizure. And those were usually in alcoholics in the study. And I, I keep using that one, but actually the most recent one that was a big meta-analysis was 1 in 30,000. Very, very rare. Yes, ma'am? So if you have people that have migraines and have had this and not had it trigger a migraine? No, it usually gets better. It usually gets better. Now, what it could make is a tension or cluster headache could make it a little bit worse until they get used to it. But I do a conservative, slow and low. So I find that motor threshold, and I usually cut it by about 20%, and then we gradually go up. Okay, but so if you develop a headache, is it relieved by a broken kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in like Tylenol. It. And usually it's the first two or three sessions. So yeah. if we, they know that they invariably get cluster headaches, hey, go take a Tylenol or a Prophen before you come in. Okay. It's usually good to go. And there is actually, there's something on the market, it's still experimental. But everybody know Imitrex or Sumatriptan, all the triptans, it's the abortive for migraines. They're actually looking for a one-time use magnetic pulse. Okay? And it goes back here because it causes both the vasodilation of the cerebral arteries 
and it also, the vertebral arteries, sorry, the vertebral arteries, so it causes vasodilation and it helps with the occiput. And so it's directing and it's turning down some of that neuroexcitability. And so there's actually a magnet being looked at for uh, a, a abortive therapy for mind It's pretty cool. Cool stuff, huh? All right. Uh, so the other main seizure is, is, is really rare. Remember, we need results. It's not a cure-all, but we do need results. And so what this has showed, uh, when it first got FDA approved, there were already 90 studies. Now there's over 200. Okay? Like I said, ECT does get a little bit higher, but they can't claim all those side effects. Oh, go back. What happened? Yeah, auto forward. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Okay. So the FDA is about 30 sessions, and that's where I, I once again, insurance I don't really understand completely. They sometimes give me whatever they want. But what 30 sessions have showed is about 75% response rate. And what does that response rate mean? PHQ9, BDI, it's going to go down two standard deviations. Okay? So if somebody's at 21, we're going to bring them down by four easily. Okay? And I can say my numbers are higher than that for that two standard deviations. Now, remission of 51%, I think that's a little high, minor around 30, 35%. About 30, 35%, I can take off meds, I can reduce the dosage, or they're not on meds again. And these effects can last up to a year. And sometimes people need a booster in six months, sometimes people, I don't see again. Um, in a good way, not like they're gone. <laughs> uh, but it is uh, pretty amazing. The, so this is actually just a, a transition point uh, before I go into ketamine, and we'll have a, a question and answer, but is there any kind of questions that are bearing down, like right now, that nothing? Yes, ma'am. I missed a few months said it, but how long are they hooked up to this? Sorry, 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so that's what I was wondering, is that if I have to add the theta burst, the theta burst is three minutes long. Now, the there are some places, the theta burst did get FDA approved for treatment, for a solo, monotherapy. However, you know, this is where government might tell you something, but the literature doesn't back you up yet. So if, if a person, if you go to a place with TMS and they say, yeah, I got treatment in three minutes and I'm done, that it is FDA approved, you are right, but the literature does not back that up yet. So I only use the theta burst for augmentation. So if around the mid point or sometime within, if I don't see a response, I add the theta burst, and then I use that for augmentation. Or I might pick a different area with the theta burst because I can play with the hertz a little bit more, so the frequency can change. So if the most is about 23 minutes then. What about history of seizure disorder? So I've already done that in people with seizure disorder, and even people that have had tumors. But what I do is, are they stable? So they've been stable for a couple years on their medication. I look at a few of the MRIs and make sure that there's not been a progression, because it can increase intracranial pressure. And so really, we're going to do that. And there was one that had something a little bit more recent, then I'll do a neuro exam on you, okay? Make sure there's no focal neurological deficits. Yes, ma'am? Your your depression is going to get better. And then fifty one percent remission where it's gone. It is temporarily gone. You don't cure. Gone. Okay. And so perhaps people come back after a year, you've been doing this for years and people come back, you know, after a year, whatever, you know. Sure. So the booster might be in uh, six months to a year. They might come back for uh, five to ten sessions. But people that have inherited with the military, the PCS here that have already done it, sometimes they come in once a month. They come in once a quarter. So we call it in ECT a tapering. Um, but it's really, really individualized. Um, and so for 30 sessions, that's, that's every day, five days a five week, days or a six week. weeks. So that's a, that's a pretty big investment. That is a big investment, and that's our, our biggest aspect. And so. Uh, I mean, we do offer the holistic, but you know, you can use family care center like a buffet. So if you are doing their meds or you're doing their talk therapy, then we'll just have those warm handoffs and talk to you and see how they're going. Because I don't usually like to taper it until the end of it. But excuse me, there's been about 12 um, in the last four years that actually they come with these really weird side effects, and I'm like, and they, they made me scurry the studies because I was like, listen, palpitations, you're sweating at night. Uh, a restless leg, I'm looking up, I'm like, there's nothing. Nobody's even made, not even a lawyer has made up something with TMS with this. I'm like, this can't be right. Well, it's on their effects are. And now the endogenous production of their serotonin or epi, this is a theory, I think, but it's, 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 uh, it's worked out a few times. So 
their endogenous production, I think, is starting to work, and so exogenously we lower down the dose. So I have tapered about a dozen uh, before that 30 sessions, um, and uh, then those symptoms go away. So it was really the side effects of the minutes. Yeah, it's interesting. Any other? And I also, this is a little high on those studies I thought on the meta stuff. Mine, mine is about 30 percent Okay. All right, another uh, kind of just a transition, doing a little bit of uh, ketamine as well with Dr. Jeff. So. All right, I'll try not to use my, uh, my outside Marine Corps voice. Thank you for all being here today. Um, you guys could have been anywhere. There's lots of things going on. You chose to come here. So I appreciate giving me and Dr. Weber some of your time today. Um, a little bit of background on me. Dr. Weber touched on it. Um, I joined the Marine Corps in 1995. I spent four years blowing up stuff, kicking down doors, jumping out of airplanes, and scuba diving. Um, after four years, I met my lovely wife, Dr. Jana Gaynock. She saw something in me, and I started up the nursing chain. I was a nurse's aide, I was an LPN, I was a combat medic. I got my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and recently my doctorate um, from the University of Texas El Paso. So I've been at every level of nursing, and I'm proud to be an advanced practice nurse. That's my little plug for APRNs. Um, <laughs> I uh, spent 20 years in the military, 22, Jana to 20. 22 years in the military. I just got out in April. So I'm still, still adjusting, um, multiple tours overseas in Iraq, and that's what brings me to this. I, on my last tour in Syria in 2017, I used a lot of ketamine, not for like this, but to put an idea of where ketamine came from and why we use it for depression and PTSD and anxiety as well, I want to give you a little background. So ketamine first, oh, sorry, thank you. Oh, I was supposed to bring this up here, so kind of to break the ice. My nine-year-old daughter told me a joke. I want to share it with you. Is that okay? It's a dad joke. Be warned. I have a seven or nine-year-old. So whoever gets it right is a proud winner of Academy Colorado Springs pack. All right. So put your thinking caps on. Why don't you play poker in the jungle? Man. Oh, I heard it. I heard it. Who said it? All right. You win a pen. Can you pass this back to her? <laughs> Keep throwing that. I don't want to throw it. Don't throw it. Don't throw it. Yeah. Workplace violence. Yeah. For those of you who didn't hear, you don't play poker in the jungle because there's too many cheetahs. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I'll be able to tell my nine-year-old that I told that joke today. But um, back to the pharmacology of ketamine. So your eyes aren't playing tricks on you. I chose this slide because things are a little bit scrambled up there with those ketamine vials. Ketamine's been around since the 1960s. It was first synthesized. Um, we started using ketamine a lot more in the 70s and during the Vietnam War. That's where it's got its fame. It's very stable. Um, doesn't cause any respiratory depression and has very few side effects. Um, I trust this drug inherently. When my five-year-old had to have surgery, when somebody pushed him off the monkey bars, ketamine was a drug that they gave him while he stitched up his eye. And Dr. Jan will vouch for that. That really happened. <laughs> um, it is what we call a disassociative anesthetic. That's how I use it in anesthesia. Um, if you had to have your ankle worked on or your shoulder worked on, this probably 90% of the time you had ketamine during your uh, anesthesia. Um, the way we use it in major depressive disorder. So for a surgery, I might use up to 100 milligrams to 150 milligrams or 50 milligrams, depending on it, a large robust dose. And with that, you get that disassociation. Um, just, you really don't care what's going on. Um, you get some opioid-like effects. It hits some of the mu receptors. So you get some pain control also. So it's a great drug. How I use it in treating depression, I use about one-tenth of that dose. A sub-anesthetic dose is what we like to call it. So for an average patient, I would use about half a milligram per kilogram. So to put that in perspective, um, my starting dose out for the average female, anywhere between 30 to 40 milligrams. So a very low dose. And what that drug does during that infusion, right here, this is what, uh, it's a lineup of an actual neuron. And I want you to kind of picture in your mind, this is the best way that I've found to describe it to my patients. If you can imagine your neurons in the fall, like a tree branch, small little buds, something's not working, not a lot of going, not a lot of going on. Those little buds are your um, synapses. What ketamine does is it goes in, this is before a dose of ketamine, this is after a dose of ketamine. As you can see, all these new little buds are popping up and the old ones are going away. Those synapses, like Dr. Weber talked, is what actually allows your brain to talk and send the neurotransmitters around. So that's one of the theorized way that ketamine works. Another theorized way that it works, it, it works on the NMDA receptor. It's an NMDA antagonist. So Dr. Weber talked about glutamate. glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. 
So what that does is it blocks it and allows more glutamate to be available in the body. Not high levels where you're going to have schizophrenia, but just kind of turn the lights on, kind of brighten things up. I explain to my patients, if your mind or your brain is like a city block and half of it is turned off the lights, after a few doses of ketamine, we're going to turn those lights on. Um, ketamine is very rapid acting. Um, patients report within one hour of infusion, they have a lifted feeling. That typically passes into the next day, but the real hero is what happens down the line when the weeks during the infusion. We usually give six infusions over two to three weeks. That's typically what I try and um, recommend for patients. That's based on a Yale study from 2010. Um, but after two to three infusions, patients have told me they, life feels less hard. I mean, it's very intangible. You all deal with psychiatric patients. To be like, do you feel better today? I give you an infusion or I give you this drug. Do you feel better now? But patients over those infusions have told me that life is less hard. A good example that I got from one of my patients is um, her daughter had to move across country. And after her, uh, her third dose of ketamine, she was able to help her. Um, so in, historically, that never would have happened. I had another patient who had fibromyalgia symptoms um, and, and depression. Her husband told me that her fibromyalgia symptoms had decreased, all of her pressure points had decreased, and she wasn't even coming in for that. I don't want to paint fairy tales, I'm not a used car salesman. These are all things that I've had for my patients, but I'm finding it, it works very, very, very well, especially when a lot of other things have failed. This is the only rapid acting antidepressant. They're using it in ERs right now for patients that have acute suicidal ideations. With one dose of ketamine, they decrease those suicidal ideations. Just that alone is amazing. Go ahead, sir. You don't need a lot. Uh, I would imagine probably 30 to 50 milligrams. Um, I don't dose like that, uh, but those are the typical doses we give in the ER for. So sub, 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 sub anesthetic dose, yeah. You're, sub, 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 sub. Yes, you get, with that much of a dose and a push, you're gonna start to have the feeling of floatiness. Um, patients say the world's made of colors and numbers. Like you're gonna get that with that dose. When I'm doing an infusion, you typically don't get that dose. You may get a light anesthetic effect. Go ahead. The reason I ask is because of the potential for uh, misuse of, of this. I get you. Yeah. So if, if you see any of that going on where there's pain of suicidal ideation to get an ER dose. That I can't, I don't want to make up stories, I don't know about that, um, but that is a possibility, but that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I've never gotten ketamine off the street, but I'd imagine it probably easier. Um, yeah. But I, that could happen. But I, I haven't had any of the, the conferences I've been to. There's actually services that are out there going and doing this, providing a service and delivering ketamine. Have that discussion. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay, so. Sure, go ahead. So, one of them even committed suicide within about two months. 
So I'd have to look at the big kind of studies, but we also are paired, Family Care Center Direct Care and the TMS with ketamine. It's, it's a medication assisted therapy. So four of us have ex designators, and so we're already treating the addicts as well. So we're going to know that, uh, one, we do the saliva test. Let me tell you, so it's, I don't know if there's any lab people, but uh, doing a UA, yeah, that can be fake. There's a lot of things. You almost get instant, uh, you know, um, veracity as soon as you're like, put this in your mouth right now. And then they put it in, and we can find if, if they're actually even using their opioids, their Suboxone. So um, I haven't really seen that. The biggest contraindication with Dr. Jeff uh, it has it kind of also noticed, and I think we've only had one patient, was ketamine uh, actually dependence. Mm -hmm. You know, because it can help with the ventral tegmental area going into the reward pathway for those addicted people. You know, or can they be actively? No, we're not going to do that. We do screening as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring up a sure. controversial way. It's just as an addict, as you, myself, as you're describing the effects, you know, my addict brain's going, wow. Sounds great. It's not going to last that long. Right. Cool. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. No, and, that, and that's a great question. And um, have patients come to me and had psychiatric disorders and said, and seeking ketamine? I've had a couple. Um, and what usually gives it away is I start off on the low end of the dose, like which is half a milligram per kilogram, which is like doc, I was telling Dr. Janet, 30, about 30 milligrams. Um, the patients, I don't, when they're in my chair, the first thing, when they come in again, how are your symptoms, how are you feeling? Um, if they're telling me it's not working, doc, I need more. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's talk about this. After a couple of infusions, it's every time, I need more, I need more. They're looking for the experience in the chair. And I, what I talked about was, when the neuronal growth, and I try and tell them, like, I know you're not feeling a lot in the chair, but how are your depression symptoms? And you can kind of start to feel like, what's going on here? And I've had a couple of patients, I'm like, we can continue this, but I'm not increasing this dose anymore. We're done, we're staying right here, and they usually don't come back. So, out of, I've done about 100, 100 plus patients, I've had one that I was like, I think we're done here. Yeah, I think you're critically diligent about the history. Yes, yes. That is a great point. <laughs> sure, what's up? Kind of follow up that. Uh, are they required to be in therapy to get this? So that they carry a uh, diagnosis of major depression or PTSD so, yeah, or anxiety? We, st we strongly yeah. encourage it, but we, we don't really mandate it uh, for them <laughs> as well. Most of the time, they're already refractory treatment resistant. So they've had 20 years of, of uh, therapy or been on 10 different meds. Now, what and this is where I believe in psychiatry as well. We reduce the symptoms, and then they can finally do talk therapy. And so, if anything, mm -hmm. maybe those symptoms, they're not acutely suicidal, and they're, they're not uh, drowning, and so they can get back into therapy. And so we're always encouraging it, but I, I, I don't do very many red lines. They're, they're, they've gotten through the door, they've gotten past the personal stigma, that's pretty awesome. And like what Dr. Weber was saying, as far as making breakthroughs, I, I don't work in a vacuum. Um, if they're a patient of FCC and they've been referred to me, I'll email their provider and say, I saw your, I saw your patient take consult went well, and I, when I'm talking to that patient before the infusion or the next infusion, I'm like, have you had discussions with your therapist? How are things going? And we can email back and forth. If they're an outside person, I give them my number because I want to talk because this doesn't work in a vacuum. Like, this isn't a miracle drug. I can't give you this and you're going to be, today I'm a 9 and if I would be a 10 if I had a latte. Like, that's not how this works. So I don't want to sell that bill of goods. It's a whole team approach. And the patients that I've seen that do the best are the ones that I'm actually talking to their therapist. Um, that is where, and when they're in the chair with me, like if they want to talk to me about things, I let them talk. I'm not a psychotherapist, but I think the real magic is when they can actually break through and get past something. Because imagine in your mind, if you're a depressed patient, that you, you're playing something over and over and over again, either an episode, something that happened to you, tragic in your life. What ketamine does is it kind of allows you to reset and refocus and maybe look at that a little bit different. And maybe, just maybe, when you talk to your therapist, you might be able to make that breakthrough that you haven't been able to do for years. Excellent. So, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What's the cost differential for TMS and TMS is covered by insurance. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think probably a better doc than I'm a business guy. So I've only had three cash pays in four years. So we, I just, whatever the insurance gives me, basically. So um, I don't know, it's all different for copay now. What, what we do for TMS is we looked all around Colorado and we found the lowest that we could find and then we cut it in half. So we do about 250 in infusion. 
We only ask for two, and then we'll individualize it. There's a lot of places that want six. Mm -hmm. They want, I, we've seen it like $1,000 in infusion. So our biggest thing was we wanted to bring it to the vets. You know, and we'll do a payment plan. We'll do whatever, just try to get them into a better place. So uh, that's kind of our cost thing. The other thing with TMS, I, I don't know. Like, I'll take whatever they give me. <laughs> you know, I think the money isn't doing cash, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really do it. It's not my patient population. Go ahead. No insurance. Yeah, I didn't think she so. said it's a ketamine covered by insurance. It's not right now. Um, I think we're moving in that direction, but currently it's not. So that's why we try to make it most affordable. Like Dr. Weber said, um, when I first started this, I looked around and there was a lot of ketamine places out there, and they were charging a lot of money. And I wanted to see like, why should this only be a treatment for people who can afford it? Like, I, two hundred fifty dollars is not chump change. That's a lot of money, but that's the lowest. And I've talked to a lot of my patients, and. They wanted to get it before and they couldn't afford it, and now they're able to do it. Um, and like Dr. Weber said, we don't lock you to six infusions. Like, I'm, I really want to get this to the people. Like, I really, really, truly think this is a ma like an amazing drug. So one to two infusions. If you think ketamine's the right fit for you, we'll continue. If you don't, I'll shake your hand. I've had patients that want to do one or two infusions, and after third infusion, want to continue. I've had patients who've gone to other places, couldn't find the money to do the infusion, stopped, and then came to me and started and completed six cycle and doing a lot better. So, when you say it's not about the money, a lot of times it actually is about the money. <coughs> so, what's an, an experience like? So, typically um, at Ketamine Colorado Springs, our infusions last about 40 minutes. So, you come in, um, wait, I do a consult over the phone, I don't charge anything. Um, I talk to you, answer all your questions, um, your patient's questions. Um, and then you book an appointment. Dr. Jana, myself, she's a doctoral level advanced practice nurse, has been a nurse practitioner since 2004. Um, myself, I've been a CRNA since 2009. So we have a lot of experience. One of us will be doing your infusion. During the infusion, um, we start an IV. Um, the ketamine goes inside of the IV bag along with some anti-nausea medication just in case. Some patients can get a little bit um, nauseous, kind of like a floaty feeling with ketamine, a little bit disconnected, very rare. Um, I've had like two or three patients report mild nausea, but I pre-treat with uh, anti-medic beforehand just to decrease that risk. I don't want anybody feeling nauseous. Um, during that 40 minute infusion, I monitor your vital signs. I've got a little monitor right there. It doesn't beep or anything. Um, make sure that your blood pressure and heart rate don't get out of range. Um, one of the side effects of ketamine, the reason we love it in anesthesia, is you can see a 10 to 20% increase from your baseline heart rate and blood pressure. Um, that's usually not a big deal in the population, but if you've got a patient who is uh, uncontrolled hypertensive, 20% can put them into the danger zone. So that's typically why I monitor that. Once the infusion is over, um, and patients always ask me, how am I going to know when it's over? I'm like, you'll know. Um, you hang out for about 20 minutes. I make sure that you're cognizant of what's going on. Um, we have someone drive you home. Um, I tell the patients, like, you're not going to be incapacitated, but today's not the day to go car shopping or talk about taxes. Um, today's the day just to relax and kind of chill out. Um, but you're not, you're not like laying on the couch, like staring at the wall. That's the big misconception. It's not like a full blown anesthetic where you're done for the day. Um, Patients come back, usually I try and do two infusions a week. It's very hard, like we all have lives, like the Yale study from 2010 says uh, six infusions over two weeks. And that's great if you can do Monday, Wednesday, Friday or whatever, um, but some patients can't always do that. So I say six infusions over two to three weeks. We try and make it work for you. Any questions about how uh, an infusion works or any of that? How, how long did you say it takes when the, from when the patient walks in the door to when they're driven home? To when they're driven home. So usually 75 minutes from door to door. Um, I pr try and pride myself on like getting you in, talking to you. I usually am talking to you while we're getting your vital signs, seeing how you're from your last infusion and getting your fusion going within about 10 minutes. Because um, that's what you came for. Anything else? Go ahead. That's okay, it's what you're for. <laughs> so what would make you choose um, as a provider? What yeah, yeah. would make you choose between uh, TMS so if I had to choose, I would say, oh, I'm sorry. She asked like, if you had to pick TMS versus ketamine, which would you pick? I would like try and cherry pick and see if we can do both. Um, what, I, what we're doing right now is Dr. Weber's TMS machines are actually right next to the ketamine suite. So we're trying to talk to patients. And I think that that is going to be your best asset. They don't interfere with each other in any way. So if I, but I, if you had to pick, I'd say there's more studies out on TMS right now than there are ketamine. Ketamine's still kind of like up and coming. 
but I think your best bet is both. Are there settings for both? There's not. We're actually we're talking about that. About that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to see if we can do some research. The, the protocol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been training TMS techs now. Um, now that we have four machines, we're probably I think we do more uh, TMS sessions in Colorado than anybody else uh, currently right now, and so. Uh, we're, we're actually looking at a training protocol for the techs. Because I really, when I get the MAs, the medical assistants or the ENTs, we really make them very specific for TMS. Uh, get, get, get through neuroanatomy a little bit more. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I think that you said at the beginning of your talk that you did a lot of ketamine in combat. Did so yeah, know? yeah, I, I should rephrase that. I, I didn't do a lot of ketamine. <laughs> Thank you for calling me on this. Yes, yeah. I gave a lot of ketamine. I think I said use. All right. So that's called the parapraxis, the Freudian slip. Yeah. So I used a lot of ketamine. So on the battlefield, the battlefield setting, um, we love ketamine. When I say love, like uh, the forward surgical teams, because it's very compact, it's very stable, and it's very potent. So and, and patients do like. Very few side effects. So if you are critically injured and your blood pressure is dropping and we just got to get you comfortable and stable enough to stitch things up, I can give you some ketamine, scramble you up a little bit while they get you stable. So it's great. That's why it got its popularity in the Vietnam War. And they figured out that ketamine was helping with depression because they were talking to depressed patients, depressed patients post-operatively. And they figured out that for some reason, patients who carried uh, the diagnosis of depression were doing better post-operatively and they couldn't figure out why. So that's what actually drove them to the studies from Yale in 2010. Thanks. Thanks for correcting me on that. I didn't do a lot of ketamine. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that put out there. Note, note to self, we're going to take an inventory. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I signed for everything. Um, I've got one more slide, I think, Dr. Jim. Oh, maybe not. I guess it didn't make it on there. It was just a uh, one of my patients telling me uh, how much ketamine helped them. I'll give you a brief synopsis of it. She came in, um, female in her 50s, been depressed for 20, 30 years. Um, I tried everything, nothing was working. This is a patient who had significant fibromyalgia. Um, after six infusions of ketamine, um, she said that her depressive symptoms had lift, lifted, her fibromyalgia had decreased, and that she would recommend ketamine to anyone who's looking for an alternative solution to the depression. That's a synopsis of it. If you want to see it, it's actually on our website, so uh, you can talk. Go ahead. Great question. So the six infusions um, last about two to three weeks, and then what we do is we call the booster infusion. So it's all based upon the patient's symptoms. So if in six weeks you start to feel like you're coming down again, they give us a call, um, and we just do one to two infusions. It's not the whole six infusion cycle. We do one to two, see if that gets you back to where you need to be, and we take it from there. So that, that was the one, I one of the cons, I guess, and I, I balked for a little bit until Dr. Jeff had kind of convinced me with the, some of the studies. It's, it's only about six weeks to three months, but I mean, truly, some of the, what's the efficacy level? 70 to 80 percent. Um, Consistently, not? Yeah. yeah. Now, anecdotally, 70 to 80 percent of patients in the studies have less symptoms of depression when they have six ketamine infusions, which is pretty amazing, and it's, it's rapid acting. Like, there's, it's the world's only rapid acting antidepressant. There's nothing like it. I haven't seen a therapy that's not working. Um, I mean, that'd be the better way to say it. Like, um, but I wish I could give you a better answer that if you do this kind of, with CBT and ketamine, that works great. Those studies are probably being done right now as we speak, trying to put it together. Yeah. Go ahead. So for, for TMS, um, it's not FDA approved. However, we have them sign a waiver. The, the magnet doesn't go below the neck. So there's not going to really be any effect. Actually, for pregnancy and schizophrenia and bipolar, ECT is a gold standard. And so I, I use that as an analogy. And so are there any big studies? No. Is it FDA approved? No. And but then on pregnant patients? Yes. No adverse effects. Yeah, as far as the ketamine side of the house, I haven't done any infusions with ketamine for patients, but I've used it. I have given it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have given it, um, it's our first line drug like for a C-section and a patient is having problems, ketamine is a drug that we give. So I've given a lot of patients who are getting ready to give birth ketamine. And, but that's, uh, you, we don't know any first trimester? Or? Um, I haven't had any, I've given it to patients, I've never heard of any reason not to give it to a pregnant patient. 
and I've given it uh, part of the pregnant patient's anesthesia. I'm sorry, what? With ketamine? Well, yeah, that, that remission, so it's response and remission, I think, that's mm -hmm. it's happening. For, it's the duration with the ketamine, you know, but it's a half-life of two to four hours that's affecting somebody for six weeks to three months. That is amazing. We don't have anything like that in our inventory for psychiatry. So, yeah, I mean, I think pretty much this not only is statistically significant, but it's also the remission. The remission level is higher than the TMS and, and ECT, actually. Mm -hmm. Come up here, I had a question. I have a question about has nothing to do with the ketamine. That's okay. Have you guys who have anything about the and kind of research? Oh, like MDMA and, and, and mushrooms and LSD and yeah. stuff so like that's that? That's okay. It's the same on the same. It's the same kind of mechanism of action is what they're studying you know, on the microdosing of LSD and things like that. So that they're doing the NMDA kind of aspect and the glutamate. They want the, the surge. Yeah, and that, and the only reason that ketamine is getting the the notoriety that it's got is because I can give you an exact dose and an exact like time frame and I can titrate that. I don't know how to titrate a portion of a mushroom or a half of a legal street drug. Like those studies haven't been done yet, but maybe. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. This is not about either one of those issues, but it's Great. about the care center. Oh, okay. so I'm a therapist at Cedar Springs and we have lots of active duty, so probably we don't have them make active care appointments, but our military dependents and our veterans have to have after care appointments before they're discharged. And this is the dual diagnosis program. Sure. We have a really tough time getting anybody to call us back in the family care center to get appointments. That's uh, we. I, that's the kind of first I've heard of that because we're actually Cedar Springs and Peaky is like one of our number one referrals. Right, you think, right? Yeah. So, so in the in acute units, there's a there's a discharge planner who's making the appointments, but our patients make their own appointments and sure. they're not getting return calls. So, um, I, I'll if look I had into. A I, person, yeah. I could call myself. That would be great. Sure. No, we, we we can give you, and I think that actually Carlos has gone by there and given the bat line to you. So uh, for, for the discharge planning not, people. It's in my program. So, um, which, which program are you in? It's the Choices, the Chemical Dependency Tool okay. Diagnosis. So is that with Dr. Bissell, Jerry? No, Dr. Shores. Oh, Larry. Okay. So the, the other, Dr. Bissell is the partial the, hospital. The partial, okay. Diagnosis okay. Diagnosis okay. okay, so, yeah, I mean, one, they also have my cell phone. But, yes, <laughs> we, we I, I can, we'll, we'll address that. Now, we did have a little bit of a wait list uh, in the beginning of the year, and we just hired three more therapists and another, uh, we have now six intake people. So it, it is, uh, you know, like I said, learning a little bit on the business side, uh, we have increased about 30 to 40 percent each year for four years. So uh, we're scrambling. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. So I, I will get back and I'll make sure Carlos will give you the bat phone uh, direct to the intakes. But the intakes also, intakes at FCCSprings.com, and I mean, they have a very fast response rate. You know, we, we did a commercial and we had like uh, like 300 voicemails, but the, the the, uh, the intake, actual number, intakes at FCCSprings.com, and we, we'll, we'll respond that day. So our patients don't have access to computers while they're with us? Sure. Right. So if we can check that ourselves? Yeah. You can send us, a, you can send us an email as well. And, and I now have Carlos go by Cedar. I stole him from you guys anyway, so he knows everybody over there. He's here. <laughs> and he's here. Is it he why he won't talk to us he doesn't like us. No, he likes <laughs> you guys. He likes you guys. What are the what are the questions? Anything else FCC sucks at? <laughs> Just joking. Oh, Just a <laughs> what was that? With TMS, is there any sort of commitment to the six weeks? Like what sort of risk would be involved with this Well, I mean efficacy, really. I mean it's not like a contraindication as far as there's something bad that's gonna happen, it's it's just not gonna work. Why the need for tape? It, it, not necessarily need for tick. We really individualize it. There are people that I don't, they don't come back there. They're good, or I see them in a year from now. You know, um, it, it's really individualized. It's really when, once they have the games. Once they're like, okay, now I was on four meds. I'm on two. Or I was on you know a high dose of Prozac. You know, like ten milligrams. And I want to sustain that. And they start feeling you know uh, the depression coming back. Most of these people, they're all treatment resistant. So they kind of they're a lot more insightful. And, Intuitive. So they're like, hey, my symptoms are coming back in six months or eight months. Could I have a tapering? Then we work with them then. So it, 
it, that that one is not a uh, one size fits all. Yeah, that's going to be very individual. I don't, I, I don't, I can't think of a study that's basically saying if you stopped it here, it's going to cause a rebound uh, suicide. Um, and once again, we always preach biopsychosocial spiritual, so we're hoping that they're in therapy and we're in contact with them. Uh, a lot of it is internal within our system, but we get a lot of external as well. So, uh, you know, we'll, just like what Dr. Jeff does, we'll do a lot of warm handoffs. And then, how do in all of the state, I don't know, but in like in the city, I think there's three of us. I know Dr. Fleming is a big one. He he's he's been doing it for for years. I think he's semi-retired now.